All right, welcome everyone. Uh, today I'm going to be talking about making uh, real-time predictive decisions with Redis. And uh, so this talk is going to be about the Redis ML module and how you can use Redis ML in a way to basically augment your existing uh, AI pipeline, or uh, sorry, machine learning pipelines and uh, really either speed up your performance or use out-of-the-box components to support the decision-making part of machine learning. For those of you who have never really uh, thought about machine learning that much, what are we really trying to do when we talk about machine learning? And really, all we're trying to do is teach a computer an algorithm. But this is an algorithm that's generally too complex for us to program directly. And so we teach this algorithm to the computer using examples. Very simple. Same way you might uh, teach a dog or teach a child how to do a task. You don't write out each individual step, you show them. And as you show them, their learning evolves and eventually they're able to do the task themselves. When we talk about machine learning problems, and we'll see some examples of these, uh, generally, they fall into sort of one of, of sort of three groups, uh, very much at the high level. You either have classification problems, which is basically about picking one of a set, assigning labels to something. Uh, even handwriting analysis is an example of a classification. I'm trying to turn a graphic of a scribble into a no, uh, known digit. Uh, regression problems are about scoring or uh, ranking items. So how likely is someone to buy something? Uh, maybe recommendations. I might want a span of what is the best recommendation to the least recommendation. And these are all about essentially assigning uh, continuous scores to things versus classification, which is again about picking sets. Then finally, uh, another element is often clustering. And clustering is I want to find similar items in a data set without necessarily describing what similar means. So I'm not giving any rules about how the, these items might look. I want to find the patterns hidden in the data. And so, for example, if we're talking about a population of people, often we talk about things like age, income, uh, city of residence. These are all sort of a priori factors that we apply and group people that way. And it's a, certainly a legitimate way to group people. Um, but you may find, if you look deeper into the data, that there are patterns that you don't necessarily recognize or know off the top of your head or uh, a classification that you're not looking for out of the box that you can find with certain machine learning algorithms, things like k-means, um, K, uh, and nearest neighbors, hierarchical clustering, things like that. All of these are mathematical techniques. You can apply them across a, a, wide, uh, a wide range of platforms and services, and we're going to look today at how Redis plays into this. Um, so when you're building, this is an example of um, a uh, machine learning system you might actually try to build in real life, a spam classifier. We're all familiar with these things. Uh, you, uh, basically, this is an instance of what supervised learning. So you're taking examples of spam and actual mail, mail you want to deliver. You run it through some algorithm, some machine, some box to, to basically teach it the difference between spam and mail. Very simple. We've all seen this. We've all used this. Um, and then you deploy this. So you take these unknown things and run it through some deployment device. And it basically splits or labels the set into to two things. It labels it out into the things that are mail and the things that are spam. And hopefully then you ignore the spam and then you look at the mail and it makes it much easier for you to work day to day. Well, how do we build these boxes, right? If you look at sort of the history of machine learning up until about the last year, year and a half, almost all of the energy in machine learning has been focused on the blue box the training, developing the algorithms and techniques to make more and more accurate predictions. Uh, but for those on the, of us on the operations and the deployment side who want to turn this into a real feature, very little up until yeah, last year, uh, two years, um, very little work has gone into this other side. It, it's kind of a, uh, what do I use off the box to basically deploy 
the result of my machine learning platform. In fact, if you look at the sort of traditional, typical Spark application, Spark ML is a very common platform that people use to uh, train models and deploy machine learning uh, over large data sets, is you have training, you have th this data gets written to the file system, and then you throw on a custom server. Your client application connects to this custom server. Well, okay, this works, but how many people have actually built these things, right? Building high-performance, reliable services are hard. And in fact, most of us, when we're, we're building a custom application, we often take shortcuts. We don't add features like A-B testing. We don't make it easy to deploy. It's always the nightmare application for our ops staff because it has very little, you know, it's, it's probably half things are hard-coded. It's highly tuned to the specific environment that we deploy it in. Because, you know, I used to be an engineer. We tend to be lazy sometimes when we write these things. We don't build out a truly production-ready app. We build out a custom hack that'll get us through the day. And so that's where Redis ML comes in. So all these things over here are looking at how to solve or how to learn models. We want to provide an off-the-shelf way of deploying models into production that your operations staff already knows, is familiar, has a well-understood protocol, and has lots of clients. So something you can adopt easily within a day to deploy these, these um, uh, models. And we do this through the Redis ML module. Redis modules, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, are new as of Redis 4.0, open source Redis 4.0. And it's basically an interface that allows you to dynamically load any, basically C, C++ library or code into Redis. Um, and one of the interesting things with models is that your modules, uh, that, and I will be making that switch a lot, and I apologize, models and modules. Modules in Redis allow you to do a few different things. Uh, you can add new commands to existing data structures. So if you don't like how LPOP is implemented or how LPOP works, you can add your own LPOP. Uh, if you want to basically add an entire new data type, you want to add trees to Redis, you could do this using a module. You could also use modules to deploy Redis as a server framework. Kind of like if you think back to the old days of app servers, like uh, you know, in, the, in the Java world. You use Redis as the framework to serve your requests and plug your own little business logic into Redis. It's kind of uh, basically a hyped up version of Lua that gives you native speed and power and also the problems of writing native code. Anyone can create a module. In fact, if you go out to redismodules.com, you'll see a wide example of modules. And in fact, Redis ML, all is out there, open source. You can go to GitHub, you can see the source for it. Um, and Redis ML is actually one of kind of the, the off off in the corner because it really uses Redis as a server framework and a, a transaction processing framework versus using it as a data store. And so if we take Redis ML, we can actually warp and change our architecture to replace the custom code uh, with off-the-shelf components. Um, you actually introduce now predictive models and a variety of different predictive models as a native Redis data type. So all the Redis functions that you have in uh, like replication, multiple keys, are all there. So you could have uh, one version of a linear regression go out as one key. You could have a, a, a B version or a second version go out as a second key. And it's very easy. Now you have A-B switching just by using the different key names. Uh, the models actually get evaluated very quickly in Redis. So you get all the speed of Redis. You still get the generally under a millisecond uh, serving time. And it manages all the connections, all the inbound clients. And it's already something almost all of your ops teams are already familiar with. And it's a great way of replacing custom code with off-the-shelf components. Now, for Redis ML, right now we support a variety of different statistical models. Remember, all of these are really just mathematical models. So if you understand the parameters to the models and the math or the equations behind it, once you learn those parameters, any, and you can learn them with any pipeline that supports the model, you can easily load that into Redis. 
So Redis supports tree ensembles. Uh, tree ensembles are a way of using decision trees, a group of decision trees to uh, basically make a classification decision. It supports linear regression. Linear regression is basically fitting the best line to a set of data. Uh, it supports logistic regression. So if you want to do, uh, logistic regression is basically for classification, linear. Uh, it also supports matrix and vector operations. So if you want to load a few matrices into Redis, do your matrix multiplications there, you can do it. Uh, there's also a few more to come. Uh, so we've been working on k-means clustering. It's actually out in alpha. If you pull the sources from GitHub, you can actually play with it. Use, um, use uh, Redis ML with k-means clustering. And because every time I give this talk, someone asks about neural nets, guess what's coming next? Neural nets. Uh, so Shai, our, our engineer at Redis Labs who maintains uh, the Redis ML module, is hoping that in the next eight weeks or so, he'll be able to release a Redis-based neural net to, uh, to the world, a functional module that will let you do neural net training and evaluation in Redis. So let's look at an example of uh, how you might do this and how you might use this. And we're going to look at the random forest type. Um, so random forests are a collection of decision trees. Decision trees are basically binary trees. The interior nodes represent some type of decision point. It could be a classification. It could be a rule evaluation. Uh, but the interior nodes are always uh, a, a binary split. Uh, if the rule is true, you go one way. If the rule is false, you go another. Um, so splitter nodes could be categorical like Sunday. So if I evaluate, is this data, is this data point in the category Sunday, uh, I either take the true branch or the false for anything other than Sunday. Uh, you can also do numerical things like less than. So if my age of this person is less than 43, I move to the true, otherwise it's false. Ultimately, you actually have, in the random forest, you have a whole collection of these decision trees. And you actually evaluate them and then take the majority decision over all the trees. And the reason we have all these different permutations of the decision trees is due to sort of a mathematical problem with the decision trees, is that decision trees tend to overfit to data. So you do a lot of permutations of the decision trees, you evaluate your data point through all of these trees, take the majority, and you get more accurate predictions. Um, a classic, classic data set that people use to learn decision trees is the Titanic survival problem. And you, uh, you actually, people have taken live data from the passengers of the Titanic, uh, basically reduced it to what's called a set of feature vectors. So things like the passenger's age. Uh, did they, are they male or female? Did they have children or siblings on the Titanic? And using this data set, you can actually do a fairly accurate prediction of who would survive and who would not survive the Titanic based on, on attributes or features of that person. Now, the data is encoded. There's a large number of different algorithms you can use to actually build the tree. There's ID3, there's CART, there's RPART, all these different ways. But ultimately, the data that comes out of this is a tree structure. Multiple algorithms each have different features as to how they build the tree, different properties, but they all output essentially the same model. And ultimately, we'll see this is a model that Redis understands. The trees are used to infer results, and ultimately, you can see here an example. So we start our first split at male. So if the, uh, if the passenger was male, uh, we move down the yes. Highly, highly, at, with one tree, Basically, one of the most uh, selective attributes was uh, sex. So if you were male, it was, or if you were female, basically you were highly likely to survive. And you'll see with trees, because we're splitting binary, you get very selective splits of your population. So for male passengers, we work down, if your age was under 9.5, so under 10 years old, you probably did not survive. Uh, if you had a lot of siblings, you actually were more likely. If you're a little older and had siblings, you're actually likely to survive. Uh, but if you had fewer siblings, uh, you were likely to perish. Um, I, I didn't make up these rules. These are things that the algorithms found um, highly predictive 
factors in the data itself. And then this gets generalized to a set of trees. So you can see various different things. Eye color blue was actually st a statistical predictor of uh, whether you would survive or perish. Um, we don't know why. There's probably no causality there, but it is significant, uh, statistically significant. Uh, so there's a correlation there. There's some correlations around height. Uh, that could be related to the age correlation or the, the age attribute. Um, but you can see how these different permutations, or like weight probably is, is correlated with age, so uh, there's probably something there. But each of these trees uses different attributes to make a decision. And ultimately, the decision comes from the leaf, uh, the leaf nodes. We take the majority decision. Um, so using that for us, if we had two gentlemen, John and Matthew, Matthew's six, a uh, young kid with three sisters from New York, and um, John is married with uh, two kids, also from New York, um, blue eyes, brown eyes, which one would survive? Well, if we go back to this set of rules and we work through it, it turns out John will actually survive. John is predicted to survive with a very high degree of certainty. Matthew, on the other hand, is, uh, is uh, predicted to uh, perish with a fairly high degree of certainty. That's great rules-wise, but I don't want to work those in my head. I would much rather have software do it. And that's where Redis comes in. I have something that learns this code. It could be Spark. It could be uh, Scikit-Learn, the Python kit. Then I want to load these rules into Redis. And this is how you do it. Two commands. Two commands to add machine learning to your environment, to your Redis environment. You create a forest using the ML forest add. And then you evaluate a forest against a certain data point using ML uh, forest run. And I'll show you an actual example of the, the so uh, software here. Oh, nope. Actually, I don't have that example. Um, one of the things you'll find with these rules is they're not designed for humans to be creating these trees. So when you create the, uh, the forest, you create it a tree at a time. So you add trees, entire trees to a forest all at once. You'll see that you have dotted paths here. Uh, this doesn't, ex uh, your path ID, you have your tree ID, so you only have to add your trees, but you have to add all the rules in a single command. So this is really not designed to, uh, for human. Uh, it's, it's actually very hard to type in even the simplest tree. Uh, it is designed for software to communicate with software. Uh, when you do the forest run, you just give it the ID and you give it features which match the features in uh, your rules. Um, features are, are generally encoded as uh, colon pairs. So you have the feature, colon, then the value, and comma. And then you can do either a classification or regression. So that's awesome. We figured out how we can predict things on the Titanic. But why would we be interested in this in kind of our real day-to-day uh, -day life where we have to keep the, bill, the lights on and the bills paid. Well, a lot of times decision trees are used in ad serving to determine what's the best ad. So I can take demographic features of a user, pipe it through a set of rules or a trained model to figure out what ad would be the most enticing for them, what is most likely to get them to click, look at something, <coughs> or uh, buy something. In, in this case, we actually, while we were working on the model, worked with a company that was trying to serve ads. They needed to serve 20K ads a second at a very low latency. Their decision system for deciding what ad to, to serve to a user was based off of random forests and campaigns that were represented as random forests. You can see these were very large and very deep trees. What we were able to do by putting Redis in here versus their homegrown Spark application was cut their AWS infrastructure by about 97%. Uh, how many of you actually pay the AWS bill? A few of you? Yeah, so this actually is a lot of money, it turns out. It's, it's, it's actually in these seven figures uh, when you can get rid of that many instances. Um, and so for you, what the, the interesting part is, not only is it going to be faster, you actually serve more, you get higher throughput with less development time, more reliable systems, 
and you cut your infrastructure. It's kind of a great win all the way around. And that ends us um, basically translating our architecture to it looks like this. You have your Spark training. That feeds into Redis ML. And then your client applications talk to Redis. There's all sorts of uh, freely available Redis clients for every language that you want to use. Um, you basically, there's multiple clients for every language you want to use. You're using off-the-shelf components, so you're, you're cutting your engineer's time to build things. You're also getting more robust software. As I mentioned, all of the features of Redis, so things like replication, multiple keys, um, uh, it's an A-B test, uh, replication, um, we talked about. Um, all of those features are available to these data types. So if you want to do HA, you just do HA the way you would do HA with Redis, however, whatever techniques you approach. So you've, you've made it much easier. You've reduced your costs. And that's Redis ML. So any, uh, I'll hand the mic out. Does anyone have any questions? Hi, thank you for your talk. Uh, just uh, one question, like how full feature is that ecosystem? I know how Spark files mm -hmm. look like and with the metadata in Parquet and all the coefficients stored there. Do I need to create on my own a utility to read that Parquet file and then run those uh, Redis commands to execute? Or is there uh, like tools already in place? Because usually from version to version, Spark changes mm -hmm. the, the format of those models. So it needs to be incorporated in that way. That's the first question. Mm -hmm. And the second question, is that a feature of Redis Enterprise only, or it can be used with an open source mm -hmm. version? Thank you. So I'll take the second question first. So Redis ML is developed entirely 100% in open source. So if you go to GitHub, you can actually pull the sources. You can see my pull requests. Um, you can use it with both open source and Redis Enterprise. 100% open source for this model, uh, module. I do, see, I do that all the time. Um, as far as the first question, um, what utilities are available to work with Spark in particular? So uh, for Spark, there's actually a second module or connector, if you will, uh, written in Scala that basically takes a uh, Spark model and loads it into a Redis database automatically. You just add a couple of lines of, of Scala code to your, uh, to your pipeline, and then it will, at the end of training, automatically load that into Redis. Now, on the evaluation side, more than likely, you're going to be writing custom code to talk to Redis. Uh, but the, the actual, in the case of Spark, uh, the connector is there. Uh, in the case of other toolkits, like uh, Scikit-Learn, for instance, there's no official um, connector yet. Uh, but actually, uh, I have public code out there on the Redis Labs blog that you can go to, and it shows you how to take a Scikit-Learn model for all of these different data types and actually load it. You can, my code's generic enough. You can run it through any model and load it into Redis very easily. Any n other questions? Anyone? Anyone over here? Yeah, we've got one in the back. Uh, we're uh, recording the session, so uh, just uh, let the mic get up there. Thanks for the talk. Uh, my question is about the model. When you create a model, whether around uh, regression, classification, or, or clustering, uh, what mechanism do you have to check the, the strength and the validity of your, your model? Mm -hmm. to check to see if it makes sense logically or, or so, scientifically. Right. So there's, there's nothing in Redis that supports training right now. The, the, all of the training is done exterior to Redis. So anything you want to do to train or evaluate the model is, is in your training pipeline. Um, there's nothing right now, uh, so post-deploy, to actually provide feedback on correctness or not. Uh, that will be later. All Redis does is take the mathematical representation of the model, maintain it in memory, and then do evaluations. So the idea really is basically instead of you having built to build the custom app to evaluate 
we have out of the box systems. Now, as far as like clustering or replication, it's all done through the Redis HA system. So if you enable uh, replication, your models will get replicated from the master to the replica. So you could end up, you have one, um, one Redis master, three read-only replicas. You can, you can basically replicate model changes to those and then point your traffic at the read-only uh, uh, for basically take advantage of the fact that this is read-only data and it's faster to evaluate when you're not doing right. All of that is really left up to you, but you get all these features that Redis already has. You don't have to build them in, which is really the strong point. Other questions? Yeah. Uh, so Mike. <laughs> uh, so building on that, are there any plans to move things upstream into the training pipeline? Um, I don't... I don't think so, except for potentially feedback. I think feedback is one of the things that's a bit missing, is now that you've deployed the model, you know, how do you provide that feedback loop? It's really the idea is to, to, to really just stick to the, let me find the slide, the, you know, the, the orangey-ish box. Right. Um, because really, if you look at, like, this, this side is pretty populated. <laughs> There's a lot of people who are doing a lot of great work, including people we've partnered with, there's very little going on over here, and it's really a, a missing part. You've basically got like TensorFlow Server, you've got Redis ML, you got like maybe one. Uh, Spark is actually kind of sort of moving into that dimension either. So I think largely for the next foreseeable future, it's all going to be focused on new data types and this part of the world. Just uh, kind of controversial question. I understand that Redis is extremely fast and all mm -hmm. of that, but were there like any benchmarks comparing like a tiny Java app having local Spark cluster uh, loading model in memory and doing some sort of predictions with a logistic regression and linear regression and the similar kind Java app deployed on the similar infrastructure just making calls to Redis for Redis to do those kind of predictions and just to compare uh, right. not only cost but latency right. and all of that. Uh, I don't know if we've actually done benchmarks like that. Shai might have. I haven't seen them yet. Um, but I don't have a benchmark I can give you today, unfortunately. Um, really what we think the strength is is in the cost reduction and then also the ability to use off-the-shelf components. Um, but it is, it, honestly, it is really, really fast. So, but like I said, I, unfortunately, I don't have a benchmark I can give you today. Other questions? Anyone? Anyone? Anyone over here? Last question? Awesome. Well, thank you all for coming. Um, I hope you have a great conference. Uh, the, after this session will be lunch. And then uh, we'll start the afternoon sessions later after lunch. I'll be around if you have any questions that you uh, want to would like to ask that don't feel like asking on mic. And I, I can answer any other questions for you about the conference. Again, thanks and enjoy your conference. <laughs>